just to let you know that today we are providing general information and advice. The information on these slides is a summary only and should not be taken as law or policy. So make sure you understand your obligations under the legislation and if you need to, you may need to seek an independent third party advice as well. I'll just talk you through um, today's objectives. So I'm firstly going to take you through the basics of therapeutic goods regulation and the role of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Melanie is then going to take you through regulation requirements specific to hand sanitizers, disinfectants and personal protective equipment for COVID-19. Please note that we won't be covering all therapeutic goods relating to COVID-19 today, such as test kits. I will then return after Melanie and explain market authorisation and your advertising responsibilities. So our presentation will take approximately one hour. We will then take a short five minute break after which we will have a dedicated Q&A session for up to one hour where we have a panel of TGA experts who will join us to answer your questions. So as we all know, COVID-19 has been declared a pandemic by the World Health Organisation, with most countries experiencing cases of COVID-19 and many experiencing outbreaks. We had our first confirmed case in Australia in January and we are responding to the COVID-19 outbreak as an emergency. The outbreak has attracted a large number of new businesses into the medical and health fields. So since February this year, more than 1,500 new organisations have registered their details with TGA. We have processed more than 2,000 applications for medical devices related to COVID-19 to be included in the ARTG. And we've received over 1,000 inquiries regarding hand sanitizers. We've also issued a number of infringement notices for COVID-19 advertising breaches. So TGA continues to prioritise and expedite all applications seeking regulatory approval to import and supply devices for the prevention, detection and treatment of COVID-19. We have created exemptions and placed appropriate conditions on exemptions to improve access. And these orders will be revoked once the pandemic is declared officially over. Full regulatory assessments are still occurring. Some approvals have been given with conditions based on information available at the time of application. So while we continue to publish information on the TGA website about medicines and medical devices related to COVID-19, the purpose of today's webinar is to help new sponsors who have not interacted with TGA before and are unfamiliar with their responsibilities under therapeutic goods legislation. We also hope to reduce the number of non-compliance cases that our regulatory compliance branch is receiving around illegal COVID-19 advertising claims, which can put the Australian public at risk. So if you're considering supplying, manufacturing, advertising, importing and or exporting a product to help test for, prevent or treat SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, then you are a potential sponsor of a therapeutic good. You will have certain responsibilities and will have to meet strict requirements under the Therapeutic Goods Act in order to avoid civil and criminal penalties associated with non-compliance. So when it comes to therapeutic goods, lots of people can be involved. This image represents different people who might have a role to play. The consumer at the top who uses the therapeutic good. We also have the wholesaler, the retailer, the importer, exporter, the manufacturer, and we also have the TGA. You could be any of the characters there circled in yellow, and you are also likely to be a consumer. So first, let's have a look at TGA, who we are and what we do. We are part of the Australian Government Department of Health. We regulate and monitor all therapeutic goods to ensure they are safe and do what they are meant to. We do this in line with the Therapeutic Goods Act, which provides a uniform national system of controls over therapeutic goods. And this benefits both consumers and industry. So what do we mean by therapeutic good? It's broadly defined as something used for preventing, diagnosing, curing or alleviating a disease, ailment, defect or injury, such as paracetamol, influencing, inhibiting or modifying physiology, such as a pacemaker, testing for a disease or ailment, such as an MRI machine, influencing, controlling or preventing conception, such as a condom, testing for pregnancy, like a pregnancy test, and replacing or modifying a part of the anatomy, such as a prosthesis. 
We have decision tools available on the SME Assist part of the TGA website to help you determine whether your product is actually a therapeutic good and also help you determine the classification of your medical device. So it's also important to know what the TGA doesn't regulate. We don't regulate veterinary medicines, health professionals, health insurance, food standards, and cosmetic and chemical standards. These are regulated by other federal, state, or territory bodies. Note that cosmetics used in surgery, such as breast implants and cosmetic injectables, are actually regulated by the TGA. It's also worth noting that we sometimes interact with other regulators. So when you work with us, you may also need to work with others. We don't research and develop new therapeutic goods. We don't provide clinical advice to individuals and we don't consider cost effectiveness or recommend one product over another or make decisions about subsidies for therapeutic goods. So when we're assessing your product for market authorisation approval, we use a benefit versus risk approach. Goods that pose a higher risk of adverse events or are used for more serious diseases like prescription medicines are more tightly regulated than those that pose a lower risk, like herbal supplements. Goods are regulated or classified into categories depending on their level of risk, such as a class one medical device versus a class two B medical device. Each therapeutic good will have different degrees of benefit and risk, but in all cases, benefits must outweigh the risks. Medicines are considered low or high risk, depending on the claims made about the medicine, what it contains, and the benefits and risks associated with using it. Similarly, medical devices are classified according to their intended purpose and the level of harm they may pose to users or patients. Classification takes a number of factors into account, including the degree of invasiveness in the human body, the duration and location of use, and whether the device relies on a source of energy other than the body or gravity. This is not a definitive list though, and therapeutic goods are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, carefully considering risk versus benefit. So therapeutic goods generally fall under three categories, medicines, biologicals, and medical devices. Let's take a look at medicines first. Prescription medicines, like antibiotics, require a doctor's prescription. Complementary medicines contain herbs, vitamins, minerals, nutritional supplements, homeopathic and certain aromatherapy preparations, such as multivitamins, some herbal teas, and essential oils. Over-the-counter medicines can be purchased without a prescription and are not complementary. So these include lozenges and some cold and flu tablets. Medicines also include vaccines and blood and plasma. So the second category of therapeutic goods is biologicals. And these are things which are made from or contain human cells or tissues or live animal cells, tissues or, tiss tissues or organs. An example is a skin graft between patients. And medical devices have a physical or mechanical effect on the body or are used to measure or monitor bodily functions. They include instruments like surgical tools, appliances like pacemakers, and materials like sterile bandages. So I will now invite Melanie to take you through information on certain types of therapeutic goods for COVID-19. Thanks, Jane. Firstly, it's important to point out that some products for COVID-19 may or may not be considered therapeutic goods. These include hand sanitizers, disinfectants, and personal protective equipment, such as face masks. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the TGA has excluded some products, such as certain types of hand sanitizers, from being therapeutic goods, so they can be made available urgently. As TGA only regulates therapeutic goods, it's important to know if you have a therapeutic good or not to understand your regulatory requirements. We'll now go into this in more detail. Hand sanitizers are products that contain antiseptic ingredients used on the skin to kill or prevent the growth of microorganisms and can be either hand washers for use with water or hand rubs for use without water. Some hand sanitizers are considered general consumer products or cosmetics and not therapeutic goods. These include some antibacterial skincare products where claims are limited to general low level activity against bacteria 
for example, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, and they must not contain substances that are included in Schedule 2, 3, 4 or 8 of the poison standard. These products are not considered therapeutic goods and are not regulated by the TGA. These products are regulated as consumer goods under Australian consumer law. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, on 28 March this year, the TGA excluded specified hand sanitizers from TGA regulation. These are known as excluded goods. These products must meet specific requirements outlined in the Therapeutic Goods Excluded Goods Hand Sanitizers Determination or the Exclusion Determination. All hand sanitizers that are therapeutic goods must be included in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or ARTG and must meet TGA's regulatory requirements. Provided the exact formulation, manufacturing, labelling and advertising requirements are complied with, ethanol hand sanitizers and isopropyl alcohol hand sanitizers are covered by the exclusion determination and permitted for use in both healthcare settings and for personal consumer use. The specified formulations are based on advice by the World Health Organisation and similar decisions by the US Food and Drug Administration. More information on these specific requirements can be found on the TGA website. While these products are not subject to therapeutic goods legislation and do not need to be included in the ARTG, they will continue to be regulated as consumer goods under Australian consumer law. For more information, you may wish to contact the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission or ACCC. These products must still meet the advertising requirements of the exclusion determination and advertising includes labelling and packaging. Hand sanitizers that are regulated as therapeutic goods make claims to kill specific organisms, such as E. coli or viruses, are to be used in clinics or hospitals, are not otherwise captured by the excluded goods determination, and are regulated as over-the-counter medicines. Here is some important information on packaging of hand sanitizers. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers and some of their ingredients are hazardous chemicals. For example, hand sanitizers may contain ethanol and isopropanol, which are flammable liquids and can also cause severe eye irritation, and hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidizer and is corrosive to the skin and eyes. Regardless of whether your sanitizer is regulated as a therapeutic good, an excluded good or a consumer product, you must ensure that you do not package your hand sanitizer in containers that look like food or beverage containers. Avoid foil sachets, pouches with a spout or containers with pop-top lids. In summary, all therapeutic goods including hand sanitizers that are determined to be therapeutic goods must be included in the ARTG, are regulated by the TGA as OTC medicines, and must meet all regulatory requirements for OTC medicines. The Australian Regulatory Guidelines for Over-the-Counter Medicines is available and contains all the details you will need to know about what OTC medicine requirements are, including, but not limited to, what supporting documentation you may need, such as evidence of quality and safety, what manufacturing requirements may apply, how to apply to have your OTC hand sanitizer included in the ARTG. You need to submit your application through TGA Business Services along with supporting data. For more information, you can contact the OTC Medicines team at otc.medicines at health.gov.au. In light of the current COVID-19 situation, there is significant interest from potential sponsors and manufacturers around how disinfectants are regulated and how to supply them. Disinfectants can be a therapeutic good a general consumer product, an exempt disinfectant, or an excluded good. What disinfectants claim to do will determine how they are regulated by TGA under the Therapeutic Goods Act. Claims may be made on the labels, instructions for use, or on promotional material. General cleaners and sanitizers that do not make disinfectant claims and are not for use on medical devices are not regulated by TGA whereas those for use on medical devices are regulated by TGA. 
How disinfectants are regulated as therapeutic goods depends on whether the product is making specific claims. Hard surface disinfectants are listed disinfectants regulated as other therapeutic goods, and they are further defined as hospital grade or household commercial grade disinfectant liquids, sprays, wipes, sponges, and aerosols that make specific claims and that are not intended for use internally or on the skin, not intended for use on a medical device, are intended for use on inanimate objects such as hard and soft surfaces, for example, curtains, floors, bench tops, lounge furniture, and carpets. These are regulated as listed disinfectants, which are other therapeutic goods. Making claims that a product kills or is active against viruses, spores, tuberculosis, mycobacteria or fungi are considered specific claims. Specific and non-specific claims can be found in the disinfectant claim guide. Exempt disinfectants are not required to be included in the ARTG before they are supplied to the market, but they must still meet all other regulatory requirements for therapeutic goods. These are hospital grade or household commercial grade disinfectant liquids, sprays, wipes, sponges and aerosol that do not make specific claims and that are not intended for use internally or on the skin, not intended for use on a medical device, are intended for use on inanimate objects such as hard and soft surfaces, for example, curtains, floors, bench tops, lounge furniture and carpets. Virucidal, sporocidal, tuberculocidal, fungicidal or other biocidal activity are known as specific claims. More information can be found in the disinfectant claim guide. An overview of how products commonly known as disinfectants and sterilants are defined and regulated can be found on the TGA website. When making new label claims against microorganisms, including COVID-19, the disinfectant must be compliant with the relevant requirements of Chapter 3 of the Therapeutic Goods Act, the Therapeutic Goods Standard for Disinfectants and Sanitary Products, TGO 104, Order 2019, the Therapeutic Goods Prohibited Representation Disinfectants, COVID-19 Permission 2020, and the TGA instructions for disinfectant testing. You should also follow the TGA's advice on the use of surrogate viruses for COVID-19 for efficacy testing. If you wish to make label claims of efficacy against COVID-19 for products that are either hard surface disinfectants or disinfectants that are medical devices, the following surrogate viruses can be used. Human coronavirus 229E and murine hepatitis virus. In the event that either human coronavirus 229E or murine hepatitis virus cannot be used, consideration will be given to the use of other human or animal coronaviruses. Viruses that have been suggested include bovine coronavirus and feline coronavirus. If coronaviruses other than the specified surrogates are to be used, please contact TGA. Disinfectants as excluded goods are products which are excluded from TGA regulation. While they may be required to meet relative legislative requirements under consumer legislation, they are not required to meet any of the legislative requirements under TGA. The following products are excluded from regulation under different legislative mechanisms. Disinfectant and sterilant gases, products represented to be for antifungal use only, a disinfectant or sanitizer registered under the Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Code Act 1994, for which no claim or representation for disinfectant use is made, other than a use which is registered for the disinfectant. Disinfectant or sanitizers that are represented to be suitable for the treatment of drinking water only and contact lens care products. To summarise, disinfectants which are therapeutic goods are regulated as listed disinfectants, class 1 and class 2B medical devices. They must meet the regulatory requirements for medical devices and their specific classification. 
Specific and non-specific claims can be found in the Disinfectant Claim Guide. And applications are submitted as shown on the slide. Guidance for these applications can be found in the Australian Regulatory Guidelines for Medical Devices, or ARGMD. You can also contact the devices team at devices at health.gov.au. Note that all COVID-19 related applications are being expedited. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, such as face masks, face shields, goggles, gowns and gloves, are designed to protect the wearer from injury, spread of infection or illness. The presentation, including claims for the product, will determine whether these products are regulated as a therapeutic good or a consumer product. PPE, which are non-sterile and designed as safety or protective apparel, are ex excluded from regulation under the Therapeutic Goods Declared Goods Order 2019 as long as they do not claim to be for surgical, medical or therapeutic purposes. PPE are regulated as therapeutic goods when they are for therapeutic use, such as being labelled for clinical or surgical use, and or claim to reduce or prevent the transmission of disease or microorganisms, such as bacteria or viruses. Products which are supplied as non-sterile are likely to be regulated as low-risk Class 1 medical devices. When supplied as sterile, they will be considered Class 1 sterile medical devices and will require manufacturer's evidence to ensure the sterility aspects have been met. And if for use in a setting that is surgically invasive to the body, for example, surgical gloves, these are likely to be regulated as Class 2A medical devices. If supply levels of PPE during COVID-19 become critically low and there are no alternative options, it may be necessary to reprocess single-use PPE to make them suitable for reuse. Reprocessing of PPE involves using a series of validated and tightly controlled steps, including cleaning and or decontamination to inactivate all potentially harmful organisms. Many single-use products are not suitable for reuse and some methods of decontamination may not be fully effective, which could expose patients and medical staff to unnecessary risks. It is recommended that only decontamination systems that are approved as medical devices for the decontamination of certain types of PPE, such as res res respirators, sorry, are used for this purpose. Due to a rapid increase in demand for the manufacturing, importation and sale of COVID-19 related products, there has been an increase in medical device inclusions in the ARTG, many of which are manufactured and imported from overseas. Some of these products do meet the definition of a medical device and must be included in the ARTG before they are supplied. Some of these products do not meet the definition of a medical device, although they may still be used to prevent the spread of diseases, including, including COVID-19, but they do not need to be included in the ARTG. Some of these products do not meet the definition of a medical device, but do need to be included as an OTC medicine, such as some hand sanitizers with specific claims that are used in health facilities. All Class 1 medical devices that are auto-included in the ARTG without pre-market scrutiny are assessed for correctness in the post-market space. A number of concerns have been raised about the quality and effectiveness of some of these products, particularly face masks, including that they are included in the ARTG but do not meet the legislative requirements for medical devices or may not or do not perform as intended. TGA is undertaking a post-market review of COVID-19 related devices that are included in the ARTG to ensure they meet regulatory requirements and are included in the ARTG to ensure they meet regulatory requirements and perform as intended. These devices are also the subject of routine post-market scrutiny and sponsor, sponsors regulatory obligations. So again, it's really important that you determine if your product meets the definition of a medical device. If so, you should ensure that it is included in the ARTG and you have the required evidence before you import and or supply it. 
For example, the information required with respect to the post-market review of a Class 1 mask includes a declaration of conformity, a list of models of masks, supply numbers by model and year if applicable, and the states within Australia where you have dist distributed face masks. Details of the manufacturing standards the device conforms to and evidence of compliance. A copy of all packaging and labelling, a copy of the instructions for use that are supplied with your product if applicable, where the intended purpose of the device claims to protect the wearer from COVID-19, either specifically or by implication, appropriate evidence to support such a claim, such as evidence from a clinical trial or testing from an accredited laboratory to a recognised standard. TGA will be publishing any regulatory or other action taken against individual products as a result of the review on our website. In summary, when regulated as therapeutic goods, PPE are generally regulated as a class one, class one S sterile or class two A medical device. They must meet the regulatory requirements for medical devices and their specific classification. Reprocessing of single use PPE should only be considered to address critical supply shortages and where there is not alternatives available. For further information, refer to the COVID-19 page of the TGA website on reuse of face masks and gowns. Again, if an application relates to COVID-19, these are being expedited. Guidance for these applications can be found in the ARGMD and you can also contact the devices team at devices at health.gov.au. Just a reminder that TGA only regulates therapeutic goods. Product safety regulation in Australia for general consumer products is a shared responsibility between the ACCC and the states and territories. The three government organisations shown on the slide can assist with the regulation of non-therapeutic goods. Visit their websites for more information on what they regulate to find where your product sits. I will now hand back to Jane. Thanks, Melanie. So now you have determined that you have a therapeutic good, let's take a look at how you supply a therapeutic good in Australia. This is a general overview. The market authorisation process um, will differ depending on what type of therapeutic good you have and its classification, whether it's a medical device class one or an over-the-counter medicine, for example. So differences in market authorisation include, but are not limited to, fees and charges, evidence of efficacy requirements, and evidence of safety and quality requirements. Advertising and manufacturing will also have different requirements depending on your type of therapeutic good. So here is an overview of the therapeutic good life cycle. This shows you how the different regulatory stages fit together. So market authorisation is the approval process to supply your product and it consists of three stages. In the pre-market stage, you compile data and information about your product and include any clinical data you have collected. If you have a low-risk medicine, like a listed complementary medicine, you don't need to provide clinical data with your application, but you must hold evidence to back any claims that you make about your product and be able to provide it later if we ask. In the processing stage, you submit your application online and attach the data and information you compiled in the pre-market stage. And if your application is successful, you move to the post-market stage, where you have ongoing responsibilities to maintain your market authorisation. For some products, you may be able to apply to the Department for Subsidy in parallel with your application to TGA for market authorisation. However, no pharmaceutical, prosthesis or Medicare listing will occur until the product is included in the ARTG. For more information about these, visit the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme website, the Prosthesis List Advisory Committee website or the Medical Services Advisory Committee website. And remember that TGA approval does not mean that your product will be subsidised. So market authorisation is required before you can supply a therapeutic good in Australia. Supply is not only the sale of a product, it also includes exchange, 
gift, lease, loan, hire or hire purchase. So things like a free sample, leasing a dentist drill and hiring out crutches all need market authorisation. If you want to manufacture, import or export therapeutic goods or arrange for any of these, you will need to apply for market authorisation. So if you're interested in manufacturing or supplying medicines or medical devices in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, you need to meet all of the regulatory requirements. And these are outlined in the relevant Australian Regulatory Guidelines document. So for example, we have the Australian Regulatory Guidelines for OTC Medicines, or ARGOM, and the Australian Regulatory Guidelines for Medical Devices, the ARGMD. So these guidelines are specific to the type of therapeutic good that you have, and these are updated regularly. So they contain further details on what is required for market authorisation and other legislative requirements that are specific to your therapeutic good. You will also need to consult the Australian Regulatory Guidelines for Advertising, or the ARG, ATG, for your advertising responsibilities. So note that these materials are for guidance only, and the relevant part of the legislation is the definitive source of information. So you can find the Australian Regulatory Guidelines under the Industry tab on the TGA website. The different types of therapeutic goods are listed underneath. Just select Standards and Guidelines and you'll find the relevant guidelines there. So once you've obtained market authorisation, you're known as the sponsor. The sponsor bears all responsibilities and is financially liable for the therapeutic good. This is the case even if there are multiple people working on different stages of manufacture in different countries. And remember the sponsor has ongoing responsibilities even after approval has been given. So when market authorisation is granted, the product is added to the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or the ARTG. This is an online database on the TGA website where you can search using keywords. And it's always a good idea to search the ARTG to see if similar products exist that are being supplied. So each ARTG entry is unique in some way. We term this separate and distinct. This uniqueness depends on the type of therapeutic good you have. You will need to look at the definition in the legislation that's relevant to your product. For example, if we have an OTC medicine and another OTC medicine that is exactly the same, but has a different name or different indications or different dosage, that product is considered separate and distinct and will have its own ARTG entry. You can find more specific information in the relevant legislation, so this example does not cover all considerations that make a therapeutic good separate and distinct. Sponsorship can happen in lots of different ways. And we'll now go through an example of a multiple sponsor scenario. So here we have a therapeutic good. Let's say it's an OTC medicine. John from Victoria would like to imp import this good for supply in Australia. So he applies for and obtains market authorisation through TGA. This therapeutic good in its exact identical form can only have one sponsor. Meanwhile, Anna from WA is interested in supplying the same product. So she has two options. She could contact John and see if she can become a wholesaler or a retailer of the good, and she needs to get permission from him. Note that there could be a commercial agreement in place that might not allow this, and John is under no obligation to have a commercial arrangement with Anna. Alternatively, she could choose to sell the medicine under a different brand name, making the product separate and distinct. In this case, she must apply for market authorisation herself. So TGA Business Services, otherwise known as TBS, is the online portal available to sponsors. This is where you submit and manage your applications and every sponsor needs an account. You can find the TGA Business Services portal under the About the TGA tab. So TGA recovers its cost through fees and charges for activities that fall within the scope of the Therapeutic Goods Act. As a sponsor of a therapeutic good, you'll be re required to pay fees and charges that apply to your good. Fees are for a service, while charges are an annual tax. 
All therapeutic goods on the ARTG are subject to annual charges, except export-only products and products that fall under the annual charge exemption scheme. We encourage you to look at the link to fees and charges so you know what to expect. So the annual charge exemption or the ACE scheme allows for exemption of annual charges until a product first generates turnover and all new entries on the ARTG are eligible for this. Sponsors need to make a declaration each year confirming zero dollars turnover. Note that fees are not included in the ACE scheme, but charges are. So you can find fees and charges under the About the TGA tab. So manufacturing involves many steps. If you're involved in producing a therapeutic good or any part of the production of a therapeutic good, you are involved in manufacturing. There are differences in manufacturing requirements for different types of therapeutic goods. Good manufacturing practice, or GMP, describes a set of principles and procedures that ensure the manufacture of medicines and biologicals are consistent and of high quality. GMP is based on principles that quality cannot be tested into a batch of product, quality must be built into each batch of product during all stages of the manufacturing process. Conformity assessment is how a manufacturer demonstrates a medical device or an in vitro diagnostic or IVD and the process to manufacture it meets the safety, quality and performance requirements. The level of conformity assessment required matches the level and nature of the risks associated with the use of the device. Self-assessment by the manufacturer is acceptable for low-risk devices, whereas for the highest risk devices, an assessment of the manufacturer's quality management system and examination of the design of a specific device by a conformity assessment body is required. If you are interested in manufacturing or supplying medicines or medical devices during COVID-19, you must meet all the regulatory requirements. And again, these are outlined in the relevant Australian Regulatory Guidelines document. For more information regarding manufacturing, please view the TGA website. There are many pages dedicated to understanding manufacturing requirements, GMP and conformity assessment. So TGA's work continues over the lifetime of every therapeutic good, from manufacturing through to adverse events. Ongoing monitoring of therapeutic goods is an important part of ensuring safety, efficacy and quality of therapeutic goods used in Australia. Now your therapeutic good is included in the ARTG, you as the sponsor have ongoing legal responsibilities associated with that good. These responsibilities include, but are not limited to, obtaining information from the manufacturer and providing this to TGA upon request, ensuring that the product's manufacturer meets the relevant regulatory requirements, paying any ongoing charges associated with maintaining the ARTG entry, notifying or requesting changes to the therapeutic good if necessary, complying with any conditions imposed on supply or advertising of the good, recording supply of the good, notifying TGA of adverse events and adverse reactions associated with the sponsored good, advising TGA of the need to recall a product, and also recalling the product if necessary. If you do not meet these requirements, both civil and crim criminal penalties might apply. See our Compliance and Enforcement Hub for more detail. So TGA monitors and enforces where necessary compliance with legislation, regulations and rules for therapeutic goods. Our regulatory compliance functions support consumer protection and enable a fair market for industry. We promote high levels of voluntary compliance through engagement and education. So advertising requirements apply to all therapeutic goods. It doesn't matter if it's a medical device or a complementary medicine. Some therapeutic goods such as prescription medicines and biologicals have requirements that mean they can't be advertised to consumers. So what is advertising? Advertising is considered as any promotional material. It includes things like labels on your medicine, and this includes packaging, TV advertisements, and websites, including social media sites.
Advertising is regulated by the Therapeutic Goods Act, the Therapeutic Goods Regulations and the Therapeutic Goods Advertising Code. Advertisements also need to comply with other relevant laws, such as the Competition and Consumer Act. The Therapeutic Goods Act prohibits, among other things, the promotion of therapeutic goods that are not on the ARTG when they should be, the use of prohibited representations, such as references to cancer, and the unapproved use of restricted representation, such as references to serious diseases and conditions like COVID-19. The Act also requires advertisers to comply with the Advertising Code. The Code regulates what can and can't be said when advertising therapeutic goods. It covers definitions and general requirements, including accuracy, scientific or clinical representations, endorsements, and testimonials. We also have code guidance available to help advertisers interpret the advertising code. So why do we regulate advertising? We regulate advertising because not only can a false claim be misleading, it can be unsafe. Advertising must not be socially irresponsible or mislead or deceive the consumer. Before you advertise therapeutic goods, it is your responsibility to understand the legislative requirements. You must pay attention to what claims you make and how they may be directly or indirectly perceived by the average consumer. As COVID-19 is a serious condition, considered therefore a restricted representation, it will need prior approval from the TGA before you can make any reference to it in your advertising. Any claims and representations referring to SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 must have prior approval before their use, as you cannot reference prohibited or restricted representations. They must be included in the ARTG entry of your, good, your goods. Any claims must not be misleading, and you must have appropriate evidence to support any of the claims you make. TGA takes illegal advertising claims seriously and can and will penalise sponsors who put consumers at risk of harm. So advertising is your responsibility. The Therapeutic Goods Act and the Advertising Code apply to all therapeutic goods to varying degrees. The Advertising Code outlines key requirements that must be met when advertising to the public. Familiarise yourself with this legislation and understand what you can and cannot do. Make sure that you're aware of what your labels, labels or any advertisement says. Are you being misleading? Do you hold any evidence? That, do you hold the required evidence that your products can be used in the way you are suggesting? Don't wait until a complaint comes through to TDJ from the public or we audit you to be compliant. You can make changes at any time to correct mistakes. We have lots of guidance material and contacts available to help you understand the code requirements and you can find these under the Advertising Hub. And again, you can find the Advertising Hub under the About the TGA tab. You can find further help via SME Assist. SME Assist is a dedicated service that TGA offers to help small to medium enterprises, startups, and researchers who are developing new medicines and medical devices understand their regulatory and legislative obligations. Our team runs workshops in major cities around Australia, which cover the basics of regulation, market authorisation, manufacturing, advertising, as well as post-market monitoring. We live streamed and recorded our last workshop in Sydney, and we also have pre-recordings of our workshop topics, and you can find all of these on the TGA website under SME Assist presentations and webinars. We also encourage you to subscribe to the SME Assist email list to stay up to date with the latest SME information, including upcoming workshops, new guidance, and webinars. You can also contact the SME Assist team via the details shown on this slide. We also encourage you, encourage you to visit our various social media sites. So thanks very much everyone for your attention throughout this presentation and again apologies for those te technical difficulties experienced at the start. Um, we'll now take a short five minute break and then we'll regroup for a question and answer session where you will have the opportunity to ask questions of TGA staff. We would appreciate if you could answer a few poll questions about today's presentation during the break. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. We will now have representatives from medical devices, both pre and post market, over the counter medicines and advertising, joining us for the Q&A session. So keep in mind that questions should be general in nature. We have reviewed your pre-submitted questions and felt that many of these have been addressed throughout the presentation. 
Um, if you still have questions, you can submit these now. Um, and if we don't address your question in this session, please email SME Assist and we will do our best to answer your inquiry or liaise with the relevant area in TGA. I'll now hand you over to Mel to facilitate the question and answer session. I'll actually start with um, some of our live questions first. Uh, we have a question for uh, OTC Medicines. Can we apply to have our antibacterial hand rub made to the WHO standard dur the, during the COVID period, or do we need to wait till the exemption is lifted? Uh, so the exclusion determination means that if your product uh, fully complies with the determination, there's no need for the product to be registered with the TGA. It's uh, excluded from TGA regulation as a, as a consequence of that determination. However, uh, if uh, companies did wish to um, have their product regulated by us, uh, then they could submit an application to us um, through the normal channels. Um, so that's definitely a possibility if, if uh, companies wish to do that. Thanks, Gailene. Uh, I now have a question for devices, uh, pre-market devices, I believe, uh, and this is from the pre-submitted questions. What does the quality assurance process need to look like for low-risk class one medical devices? Uh, in the case of class one medical devices, non-sterile medical devices, the, the minimum conformity assessment requirements don't call for a quality assurance system or a quality management system. However, TGA still would prefer for manufacturers to apply the principles of ISO 13485. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'm just going to now ask uh, a question from our live questions. Uh, and this one will be for uh, OTC Medicines. At the start of the presentation, you stated that exemptions will be revoked once the pandemic is over. Is there, there a confirmed or theoretical timeline on this? So the intent of the exclusion determination would be that it would uh, run for the period of the pandemic. So it's envisaged that once the pandemic is officially declared over, uh, presumably by the WHO, uh, that the exclusion determination would be revoked at that time. Uh, there's no obviously no timeframes in place for that, but I would imagine that uh, the pandemic would officially run for probably 12 months. Uh, and then, then once uh, that uh, is declared, then the determination would be revoked. There is always a possibility that it could be revoked earlier um, if need be, but at this stage, it will be for the full period of the pandemic. Thanks, Gailene. Uh, we now have a question for advertising. The question, Leanne, is what are the do's and don'ts when it comes to advertising on social media platforms like LinkedIn? Is there a one-stop shop where we can find all relevant information about advertising therapeutic goods? Thanks, that's a great question. So the advertising hub on the TGA website um, provides um, up-to-date guidance that um, will give you a comprehensive picture of the advertising requirements and it will include links to the relevant legislation that you will need to apply to your advertising for therapeutic goods. It's important to note that social media advertising is treated virtually the same as advertising in any other traditional media like television or newspapers. Um, and the same requirements do, do generally apply and there may be additional requirements if that advertisement um, can lead to the purchase of a, a therapeutic good. 
Um, in terms of advertising in this COVID-19 context, the most important thing to be aware of is that you cannot use um, claims about COVID-19, um, even if they're incidental references, like, um, you know, in this COVID-19 pandemic, we're working hard to make sure, you know, you have a good supply of products. Even incidental references like that are prohibited or restricted under the Therapeutic Goods Act. So um, before you before you um, use such a claim in advertising, please um, double check the content on the website and contact us if you're in any doubts about whether or not you can make the claim. Thanks, Leanne. Um, Leanne, while you're there, we actually have another question for you. Is any mention of COVID-19 in an ad without virus-related claims a restricted representation? For example, washing hands more frequently during the COVID-19 pandemic, don't forget to moisturise with XXX brand to prevent skin from drying out. Thank you. That's another really good question. So, uh, yes, even if the um, reference to COVID-19 is not being made in um, a direct claim about a particular therapeutic good, it's still a restricted representation and cannot be used without approval or permission from the TGA. Thanks, Leanne. Um, Leanne, we actually have another advertising question. We might as well keep you there while, while we have you there. Do downstream resellers have the same obligations in relation to advertising as the registered sponsor? So I would take that as uh, people that are, you know, a retailer, for example. Sure, thank you. So uh, as a retailer or a reseller, yes, if you are advertising therapeutic goods, you have obligations to ensure the advertising meets the therapeutic goods advertising requirements. Um, it may be that you are using advertising that has been provided by, say, the sponsor of the goods. Um, in those cases, you still need to take steps to ensure that um, the advertising will be compliant with the requirements. Um, and also, if you are generating your own advertising, you will also need to make sure they comply with the requirements. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you. Okay, we now have a question in relation to devices. The question is, is the list of things we need for TGA's post-market review of COVID-19 devices on the TGA website? Yes, any post-market medical device review that we're going to undertake, we were clearly uh, providing information on the website through the COVID landing page, uh, specifically detailing what it is that the TGA will be asking for. Thanks, Brian. We have another question for devices. Um, do isola oh, sorry, isolation gowns need to be certified? Yes, isolation gowns by their very intent would need to be included in the ARTG as they are mainly intended to reduce the transmission of bacteria, viruses or microorganisms. Thank you. We'll ask you another one while you're there. Uh, do we need to get the PPE certified by, for example, NIOSH to, val to validate that the testing performed on the mask confirms the intended use of the manufacturer? Uh, the manufacturer needs to hold evidence for any claims they make. So if they are claiming to like compliance to a standard, we would expect them to hold certification from an accredited testing body demonstrating compliance to said standard. Great, thank you. We might ask some questions um, of OTC now. Is there any advice for businesses that would like to continue to provide hand sanitizers to the market after the pandemic? 
Okay, that's uh, an interesting question. So uh, it depends on how you are presenting your product. If it's been uh, presented as a cosmetic in that it has low level claims and is not being pre presented for supply in a hospital or healthcare setting, then the product can continue to be um, uh, supplied in the, in the market as a cosmetic. Uh, if it's, uh, as I mentioned before, with the exclusion determination, if it's a product uh, that would be compliant with that, once that uh, determination is revoked, uh, then uh, products that were subject to that may not be able to continue to be supplied uh, if they are presented for supply for use in hospitals. In that case, they would be considered a therapeutic good and would have to be registered uh, with us. Uh, if your product is already uh, considered a therapeutic good uh, in the way it's being marketed and supplied, uh, then yes, it would uh, definitely be required to be registered with um, the TGA. So hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Gailene. We actually have another question for OTC. What sort of supporting data do you need for general antibacterial claims, for example, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria in association with a cosmetic? Uh, so cosmetics aren't regulated by TGA. Cosmetic products are regulated by NICNAS and by the ACCC. Uh, so I can't answer to what data requirements are required for them. I can only uh, answer in terms of what we require for safety and efficacy data for uh, TGA regulated therapeutic goods. And for those TGA regulated products, we need uh, data to support the safety and efficacy and uh, we've uh, required um, uh, testing in accordance with various EN standards to support the use of the product. Uh, for TGA regulated products, uh, we don't uh, permit uh, kills 99.9% .9 of, of, of germs because it's actually not an accurate claim um, in terms of the testing that we receive. Okay, thank you. So we'll have some more questions for devices. So the question is, do face masks have to be tested to AS4381-2015? Only if the manufacturer claims that they are aligned with that standard or for that purpose. Okay. Uh, another question for devices. Um, Regarding the application fees, besides the original 540 or 1040 application fee, I can also see a 3910 fee for verification of sponsor's application and evidence of conformity. What's that? Is it compulsory for every product such as face mask? And when would that fee be charged? It's so quite a long answer. Sorry, Brian, uh, let me know if you need me to repeat. That's That fee relates to a level one application audit. So there are times where the regulations prescribe that the TGA must select certain high risk products for a mandatory application audit. In the case where we don't require clinical evidence, then the products would go through a level one audit and that fee would be applicable. Uh, we have guidance in the ARTG inclusion or the medical device inclusion process on application audits and when a device may be selected for a mandatory audit. Okay, another question, Brian. How about fogging systems? Is it considered a device and does it need to be listed? Again, it really comes down to what that fogging system is doing. If it's only to be used as an applicator for a disinfectant, unlikely that the applicator itself would need to have TGA approval. We would have more concern over the substance that's being fogged. All right, thanks, Brian. We might actually ask um, some advertising questions now. So for advertising, can we use statements such as TGA approved or similar? Statements like TGA approved are what we consider to be um, a statement or implication of government endorsement 
and government endorsement is prohibited under the Therapeutic Goods Act. So no, you cannot make those sorts of claims. It is permissible for you to indicate that your product is included in the ARTG and include the ARTG number in the advertising and there is guidance on the advertising hub about the appropriate format for those claims. Thanks, Leanne. Another one for you. This one says, hello, Leanne. Just a quick question regarding product advertising. Is it okay for advertising materials to mention coronavirus instead knowing that the general term coronavirus has become more synonymous with COVID-19 than with H1N1, SARS, et cetera? Would that be considered a misleading claim? Hello there, that's, that's another really good question. And I think you're right, in this, in this context of the pandemic, um, consumers will make the neck connection between a reference to coronavirus and uh, COVID-19. So therefore, if you're using a reference to coronavirus in advertising, you effectively need to treat it as a claim for COVID-19, which will be a restricted or prohibited representation. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, okay, we'll now ask a question um, of OT, at OTC. Uh, the question is, does ethanol-based hand sanitizer gel need to be TGA approved for sale in state schools? If the product uh, has low level claims um, that it's, and, and doesn't have any claims that are referring to specific organisms, and it's not being presented for supply in a hospital, then, uh, and it's just for use in a school, as for general purpose uh, use, then no, it doesn't need to be registered with the TGA. Great, thank you. We'll now ask some more device questions. Uh, the question is, for class one medical device inclusions where only a declaration of conformity is required for submission, is this declaration of conformity required to be completed by the manufacturer or the sponsor? The manufacturer is responsible for applying the conformity assessment procedures, including the completion of the declaration of conformity. This document should be held by the sponsor in case it's requested by the TGA. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now take another question for devices. Uh, and the question is, once I find it, I do apologise. Okay, is it? lots of questions coming in. Um, okay. Who decides the level one, two, or three of an imported face mask product, surgical mask? The manufacturer is always responsible for providing the device's intended purpose. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we will also ask another device question. Does the TGA re require an accredited laboratory to conduct the PPE testings? Uh, the manufacturer should ensure that any any testing laboratory that they use hold their relevant accreditation either locally or internationally. For Australia, we would expect NADA accredited testing laboratories. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just keep going through our questions here. Um, Okay, so another question for devices. In relation to disinfectant wipes, if the wipes kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria, are they regulated by TGA? No, the claim of kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria is a non-specific claim, so they would not be regulated as a listed disinfectant. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so we'll now ask a question um, for uh, OTC. Um, now this one, it, it could potentially be devices as well, but I'll, I will ask it. Um, for hard surface sanitizers to be listed and be able to claim virucidal activity, does it need to go through the process of an other therapeutic good or an over-the-counter medicine? Being that the product is for hard surfaces and not intended to be used on the skin, it would be a OTG listed product and would need to comply with the testing requirements of TGO 104. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Now, Brian, I'll just ask another question of you. There is also a fee um, for conformity, oh, sorry, as conformity assessment bodies designation determination, which is 74,600 or 53,600. What's that? So this is an outcome of the Medicines and Medical Devices Review where the government decided there should be another Australian conformity assessment body other than the TGA. So should someone like a, a BSI or a TUV product services decide they want to wear the TGA conformity assessment body hat, they can apply to us to be designated to fulfil this role. Um, now we just have another question, Brian. Sorry, can can we say again the name of the PPE testing labs in Australia that TGA accepts? We would accept testing from any accredited testing body. So NATA, NATA, is responsible for accrediting testing bodies within Australia. Okay, great. Um, Sorry, and there is another question about disinfectants whilst you're there. Are disinfectants, in, sorry, are disinfectants intended for use for, sorry, for use to disinfectant medical devices, so to disinfect medical devices, be, be a class one or class two B medical device? Any, any product presented to disinfect or sterilize a medical device will automatically be regulated as a class two B medical device. All right, thanks, Brian. We'll have a question now for advertising. Uh, Leanne, if I am importing from overseas a hard surface disinfectant and we ensure, ensure Australian labels and advertising do not make claims, but the overseas company does on their website, are we liable for their claims? So that, that's a really good question. And yes, if um, if you are somehow in control of that overseas website, then yes, we would consider you um, responsible for that and they would need to comply with the Australian advertising requirements. Um, there are some situations in which there's no relationship between the Australian sponsor and the overseas website, but... Um, you know, there'd be no way you could link to that content or use it in any way for your promotions. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll ask OTC a, a very general question now that that's, that's um, popped up. Um, we'll do our best to answer this one. Um, Gaylene, if you can, what is the distinction between listed and registered medicine with respect to OTC and complementary medicines? Okay, so that's probably a little bit outside, I suppose, uh, what this um, webinar is about, but um, I will attempt to answer it um, as, as um, succinctly as possible. So um, a listed medicine are medicines that are considered to be um, low risk and tend to cover off products like vitamins, minerals, herbs, um, and complementary medicines. Listed medicines also include sunscreens as well. Uh, registered medicines are, are the higher level medicines, which are prescription medicines and over-the-counter non-prescription medicines. So with listed medicines, uh, all those medicines um, can only include uh, ingredients, active ingredients that are included in a permissible ingredients list. 
and they can't include anything that's outside of that um, ingredients list. And they also have a, a prescribed set of indications that they're allowed to make. The listing process is somewhat different in that the medicines aren't uh, pre-market evaluated prior to inclusion on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, but they go through uh, compliance reviews afterwards. Um, not all of them, but on a um, uh, sort of random basis or perhaps a targeted basis. For all registered medicines, there is a pre-market evaluation process um, for both prescription medicines and over-the-counter medicines. So sponsors submit an application with all the required data and we evaluate those products. For over-the-counter medicines, that's anything that you can get over-the-counter without needing a prescription for. So um, what we call S3, which is pharmacist only, S2, which is a pharmacy medicine, and unscheduled, which you can get from your um, supermarket. So um, hopefully in a nutshell, that kind of um, explains a little bit about the difference between uh, listed and registered medicines. That's fantastic. Thank you, Gaylene. Um, whilst we have you there, um, companies are considering having a sanitising tunnel, which people would walk through. What kind of registration has to be done to have a sanitizer listed as safe to be used in this kind of a concept? Uh, that's um, a very good question. I might have to take that one on notice. I can't answer that. Uh, that's um, a very good question. I might have okay. to take that one on notice. I Gaylene. can't answer that one um, off the top of my head. We do have another question for you, Gaylene. Um, my question is, I manufacture a hand moisturiser with all natural ingredients to help against rash and itchiness, to protect against harsh sanitizer, sanitizers and masks. Would this be classified as a topical application and would it need to be registered with TGA? Would you like me to repeat yeah, that? So yeah. it's a hand moisturiser. A hand, correct, uh, to help against rash and yeah, itchiness, so to protect against harsh sanitisers and masks. Uh, depending on how the product is presented, if it's been planted uh, Depending on how the product is presented, if it's implying that it's got a therapeutic use, then yes, it would need to be uh, regulated by the TGA as a therapeutic good. So it comes down to A, what the ingredients are, uh, whether there's any uh, scheduling requirements for those ingredients and what the claims are. If there were purely uh, cosmetic type claims to to um, to relieve the, you know, to improve the appearance or, or sort of general claims like that, uh, then it would most likely be re regulated as a cosmetic and therefore not uh, under the remit of TGA. Uh, however, if it went further, talking about prevention or treatment, um, then then it might um, push it into the TGA therapeutic goods space. Thank you. We have one more for you while you're there. How about hand sanitizer sterilising devices put on an escalator handrail, is it required to be registered with TGA? If it's for use on a hard surface, which it sounds like it is, then that would be um, probably one for Brian to answer, uh, because that would um, be considered a disinfectant. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Thanks, Brian. How about hand sanitizer sterilising device put on an escalator handrail? Is it required to be registered with TGA? It, it really depends on the claim that it's making. Um, you know, it sounds to me like it's just a, you know, if it's not making a specific claim, then no. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so another question for um, devices while you're there, Brian. I read news that there are currently prioritising procedure of approval of goods used for COVID-19. Is it true? How long would it take to get a therapeutic? So I believe they're talking about the expedited approvals or, or um, processing of applications. How long would it take to get a therapeutic good approved by TGA now if it's for COVID-19? 
is there any extra fee payable by a sponsor? So firstly, yes, it is true. The TGA are currently expediting applications for any product that's going to have an impact on the treatment, diagnosis or prevention of COVID-19. Uh, in the past, we did have an expedited review process where sponsors could meet with the TGA, pay an additional fee for prioritising the review of their, of their new or novel technology or their product that would have a significant impact on the Australian public health system. Uh, the TGA has bypassed this process and on notification from sponsors, we are automatically expediting their applications. An example of the time frame reduction, we would normally you know, process a, a class 2A thermometer within 20 working days. These things are being approved within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, similarly, for COVID-19 tests that have to go un undergo a mandatory technical file review, this could normally take one to two months, whereas under the expedited pathway, we're seeing them done within a week. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have another question, Brian. Um, do thermometers fall under class one measurement device? This all depends on how the thermometer achieves its action. So for a battery powered or an active medical device or an active thermometer, that would be a class 2A, whereas your older mercury style or forehead strip thermometers would be a class one measuring. Great. Another question, Brian. Our face shield splash shield is reusable. If disassembled and sanitised at a hospital and reassembled, uh, is that then considered manufacturing now? Okay, so great question. For all reusable medical devices, the manufacturer should provide appropriate instruction to allow the safe reprocessing for safe reuse of the device. So long as the hospital or healthcare provider are following those instructions, it is not considered to be a step in manufacturing. Great, thanks Brian. We might now ask some more advertising questions. Question for you, Leanne, is can I say we use an approved TGA active? Thank you, another awesome question. There's lots of them today, it's great. So, um, in essence, this would still be an implied government endorsement, this sort of claim, to say that you, you use a TGA approved active in your therapeutic good and that would be um, would be prohibited under the Therapeutic Goods Act and the Advertising Code. As I mentioned before, you can um, put a statement on your advertising to say that your product is on the ARTG and the ARTG number so people can look um, for the product on the ARTG instead. Thanks, Leanne. Another question for you, Leanne. It's a question about advertising. Uh, use of hashtags such as hashtag COVID-19. Uh, hashtags are my favourite. <laughs> hashtags and hashtag stacking. So we consider the use of hashtags in advertising and social media posts that constitute advertising to be part of that advertisement and therefore they do need to comply with the advertising requirements. As I mentioned before, um, references to COVID-19 are either restricted or prohibited representations that can't be used in advertising without the TGA's prior authorisation. And at this point in time, the only authorisation we have given for COVID-related claims is for certain disinfectants, which are listed on our website. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, we might now take a question for Chris um, in relation to post-market devices. The question, Chris, is, and it's actually directed at you, Chris, uh, with the post-market review, how is the process executed? Do we happen to submit documents through EBS? Also, uh, one of the requests was to provide samples of the medical device. How is this sent to TGA? Um, so this is the post-market review of um, masks. Um, there's quite a large number of masks currently on the register, so this is a process that may take some time. 
Um, the initial contact will be via email to give the sponsors some information about what's coming. Um, most of those are sent out now, uh, although there are still some being processed and there's been a significant number of masks put on the register in, in the last couple of months. Once, um, once all the sponsors have received the email, the um, Section 41 JA request for information will then be provided to you. Um, the 41 JA request lists all the in, um, information that's required. Um, it'll give you uh, um, instructions on how to um, supply the documentation and that will be to an email address within the TV, TGA. And um, if samples are required, that will also be provided in the request for information. So while you'll get a, an email first, um, as soon as possible after that, you'll get the, the official request. All the information will be in that request. Great, thanks, Chris. We might go back to OTC now. And the question is, if we are unsure about our products, should we apply for TGA approval anyway? For example, hand sanitizers. Uh, if you're unsure about your product, um, it's probably best if you contact us and then we can give you a, some advice as to, to where your product lies, you know, whether it's regulated by us or by Nick Ness and ACCC. So I would recommend doing, doing that. Um, as I mentioned before, if your product is intended for use in a hospital setting, then it would definitely require TGA regulation unless it's one of those that would be excluded under the current exclusion determination. Thank you. We have another question, Gaylene. What would be the average time from market authorisation to approval for a simple ethanol-based hand gel, please? Uh, like Brian was saying earlier, we're um, expediting and prioritising all applications we receive at the moment that are related to uh, COVID-related um, um, supply and demand issues. So um, if we receive an application for a hand sanitizer product and the application is uh, complete and includes all the information that's required, then currently we're, we are um, able to process and approve applications within two to three weeks, uh, de obviously dependent on the application being a complete application. Uh, and a, just another one uh, for you, Gaylene. The TGA website says labelling for the ethanol hand sanitizer, 80%, can have the optional text saying, suitable for use in medical and health services. Is it also permissible to say that the same sanitizer is medical grade? Uh, so on products that are subject to the exclusion determination, only the label claims and statements that are outlined in the exclusion determination are permitted to be included on those labels. If it's a product that's outside the exclusion determination, such as a cosmetic, um, statements such as um, includes, you know, includes hospital grade or hospital grade formula um, are generally um, allowed, provided um, it's not um, stated too prominently on the, on the label and couldn't imply that it's um, suitable for use in a healthcare setting. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we also have another one for, for you, Jaylene. Uh, actually, no, not at the moment. We'll actually move on. We'll ask for some device questions. Okay, so the question, Brian, is if a product from a manufacturer is already listed in the ARTG by another sponsor or distributor, can you register the product as well if the manufacturer approaches you to become a sponsor distributor as well? Yes, you most, you most certainly can. So the ARTG is not just a list of all the products available for supply in Australia, but it's also a list of all the importers or sponsors legally responsible for those products they are supplying. So if you go direct to a manufacturer and the, or overseas supplier and import the medical device, you need an ARTG entry. 
if you do that on behalf of or under agreement with the current Australian sponsor, then you're just considered to be part of the distribution chain as they hold the ARTG entry. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, there is another question for you. Um, now, this question is, if you are supplying a disinfectant product, being a wipe, and on the packaging, call out effective against flu virus. Is this something? Sorry, is this is something like this required to be registered? And then on back of pack, um, it, it claims to fight germs, including E. coli, etc. Thank you. So, in respect to all hard surface disinfectants, the TGA has a disinfectant claim guide on our website guidance which specifically details what we would consider to be a specific claim or what would be a non-specific claim. So I would refer people to the, the overview of disinfectants, sterilants and sanitary products as this details the disinfectant claim guide. Thanks, Brian. Another one for you, Brian. If we are in, now this one is actually directed at Leanne, but I believe that you, you may be able to answer it. If we are importing a disinfectant and meet all the exempt disinfectant criteria, is there a separate market authorisation process we need to go through? No. Uh, however, you do need to bear in mind that exempt disinfectants still need to meet the requirements of TGO 104. However, there's no requirement to include or list them in the ARTG. Okay, thank you. We have another devices question. Lots of devices questions at the moment. For class one and two devices, what are the package labelling requirements? For example, requires English, Australian sponsor details, etc. Okay, so we recently published a specific guidance on labelling to clarify this for new sponsors in the COVID space. However, yes, um, all, all information must be provided in English. There is no restriction from providing it in other languages, so long as you do also provide in English. Uh, the sponsor details must be supplied with the device, but for the full detail of the requirements, you can either refer to our labelling guidance on the COVID landing page or the Medical Devices Therapeutic Goods Regulations 2002, Essential Principle 13, details all the information that must be supplied with a device, including its location. All right, thank you, Brian. We'll actually move back to some advertising questions now. There's been a lot come through. Um, so the question is, if it's a media release that the manufacturer publishes on its own website and via other news channels, are the media releases considered an ad advertisement, therefore cannot contain statements such as TGA-approved products? Media releases are one of my favourite subjects at the moment. <laughs> um, so if the media release is purely factual and balanced and, you know, tells the full story and it's published or, you know, given to media outlets um, rather than being published on the sponsor's website, say, then it's probable that it would not be considered advertising. However, where some um, sponsors are running into trouble is by publishing it on their own website or their own social media and using language that is quite promotional. Um, so, you know, using superlatives like exceeded expectations, um, excitable sort of language like breakthrough, um, things like that it is highly likely to be considered promotional. And of course, it's a, if it's on your own website or your own social media where you're already promoting your products, it will be promotional and would therefore need to comply with the advertising requirements. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, we have another question for you. Um, in uh, yeah, relation to advertising, do we need to send T to TGA advertising team to check if our uh, sorry if our marketing material is okay to be published? Okay, so um, 
The answer to this is going to depend on what sort of advertising and for what sort of product. So if you're advertising a medicine and you intend to ad advertise that medicine, including um, a registered hand sanitizer, if you're intending to advertise it in um, free-to-air television, newspapers, mag magazines, billboards, you will, up until the end of June, need pre-approval through um, the TGA for that advertisement. You will also need pre prior authorisation from the TGA if the advertisement contains a restricted representation. A restricted representation is a reference to a serious form of a disease, condition, ailment or defect and, a, and that's, that definition is included in the code. That requirement is not changing. Um, but apart from those two requirements, there is no need for you to send your advertising to the TGA for prior approval um, or clearance or anything like that. We do try to be as helpful as possible, but um, we do we can really only provide you with general advice. And for those reasons, if you think you need, some tailored assistance to look at a specific ad or advertising campaign you intend to run, we recommend that you seek assistance from a regulatory affairs consultant or a lawyer that specialises in therapeutic goods in particular. Um, and on the TGA's website, you will find a list of organisations that can help you locate a suitable regulatory affairs consultant. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, we do have another question for you. Um, we wish to make a generic claim of reduces the risk of transmission of infectious diseases. Is this an acceptable, sorry, is this acceptable or is it considered a restricted representation? And that was transmission of infectious disease. So that, that's a really good question. Um, infectious diseases are diseases that require um, diagnosis and generally treatment or monitoring. Um, by a healthcare professional. And for that reason, yes, we would consider it most likely to be a restricted representation. Okay, thank you. And just one last one for you, Leanne. Uh, does the prohibited representation approval that the TGA has issued cover both label and other forms of advertising? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm sorry, I don't have the permission in front of me, um, but it should tell you the, the permission. If you look at it on the TGA website, um, it will say whether it's limited to labels or not, but I think it is broader than just labels. Okay, great. Thanks, Leanne. We'll now um, ask Chris from Postmarket Devices a question. This is a question, Chris, on alcohol hand rubs. We have seen a number of ARTG entries, disinfectant hands. Are those excluded who formulas? Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to indicate that the disinfectant hands that, uh, that are on the ARTG uh, currently, as particularly as class one medical devices, are actually incorrect. And we are in the process of uh, proposing to cancel them from the register. Um, it's a factor of um, class one medical devices, generally speaking, are auto included. So this is something that we have to follow up in post-market. But that GMDN term is not appropriate for um, a medical device. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll now move back to OTC. Okay, so this one is out there saying, hi, Gaylene. Generally, what application level is a hand sanitizer? N1 or N2? Uh, 
Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, there's currently, well, there are five application levels for OTC medicines. So the N1 uh, is the lowest level, and it is for applications which are uh, purely a name variant of an already approved product. So if there's or an already approved hand sanitizer on the product, and a sponsor wishes to introduce a name variant of that uh, product uh, into the market, then they can submit the application at the N1 level. And that, when I say a name variant, the only difference between that and the approved product is the is the name of the medicine. Uh, there's no no difference uh, to the formulation. For the next level, which is the N2, that is for products that are based on an OTC medicine monograph. So there is a specific hand sanitizer monograph that specifies what ingredients are permitted in the hand sanitizer. Uh, what the quality standards are and what label claims can be made so and, and what efficacy requirements are, are for those um, monograph um, products. So that's uh, for the N2. Uh, then most of the hand sanitizer applications we receive are at the N4 level, which is where uh, efficacy data needs to be required and submitted to TGA for evaluation by us. So that's the majority of the applications for hand Thanks, Gaylene. Uh, we do um, have another one for you. Level. Hi, Gaylene. We are new to the hand sanitizer business. How long generally would it take someone like us to meet specs under the TGA and gain approval? Is there the ability, ability to garner support or advice from someone at TGA to assist us in gaining approval? So we can provide general advice about what so we can provide general advice about what uh, data requirements would be uh, needed for your for your product, and um, and point you in the direction of the guidance on our website. For more specific regulatory advice, uh, for those who are new to this area, we always recommend uh, that you seek the advice of a regulatory affairs consultant. Uh, and the TGA has a list of industry associations that can point you in the direction of a regulatory affairs consultant. Uh, in relation to timing, um, I mentioned earlier that we are prioritising applications. Uh, however, you, know, you need to ensure that you have all your information together uh, in relation to the quality aspects of the product um, in terms of testing, stability testing, and also the safety and efficacy testing for the medicine. So that's probably more where the time constraint would be at this stage. Great. Thanks, Gaylene. All right, we'll just quickly ask uh, uh, another device question. Brian, the question is, the ARGMD is showing as a historic document on the TGA website. Are there plans to republish soon? There most certainly are plans. Uh, it will not be in the same format as the previous ARGMD. As people may be aware, it was a 330-page storybook approach to the regulation of medical devices. Uh, we have relaunched the ARGMD landing page where we will be publishing new and updated information when it becomes available, uh, including the medical device inclusion process, which was lacking from the previous ARGMD. Understandably, there are a lot of reforms in the pipeline, so this guidance will be developed over time as those reforms are consulted and implemented. Right, I think we've got time for one more. For PPE, is there specific labelling and instruction requirements? For PPE in general, that is not presented for use in a healthcare environment or is not making you know, therapeutic claims, we can't comment, it's just a consumer good. But yes, for PPE that is presented as a medical device, they need to comply with the labelling requirements as described under EP13 in the Medical Devices Regulations 2002. Great, thank you. I'm going to hand back to... Rachel, Jane, sorry, Jane. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for your attention today. Um, thanks very much for submitting all of your questions. It was lovely to see a, a great blend of, of topics. And thanks very much to our panel as well for joining us today. Um, there are a few questions about uh, publication of this presentation. 
we are planning on publishing um, the audio and this presentation on the TGA website. So if you subscribe to SME Assist, uh, you'll be notified when that appears up on the website. Um, we have tried to get through as many questions as we could. If we didn't cover your question today, please feel free to forward that to SME Assist and we'll do our best to respond to that or liaise with the relevant area across TGA. Thank you.